All right, let's look at uh, <clears throat> where we are in the Revelation. And, and I've just titled this session as we begin chapter 6, The Beginning. So why, why do we call chapter 6 the beginning? Because it does move into a different part of the book of Revelation as far as kind of the movement of the vision that Jesus has been giving John. <clears throat> Up to this point, chapters 1, 2, and 3 have been more about what happened on earth. He showed him the churches, and he gave him the messages that go to the churches. And we know in 4, beginning of 4, <clears throat> between 3 and 4, the church is raptured up, is taken out. Uh, the church is not mentioned again until Revelation 19. So from the end of 3, chapter 3 to 19, uh, we don't have any mention of the church in, in this. And so we know that the church is out. It's been taken out of the picture. And so now we're beginning. Chapter 4 was giving us this vision of the throne room. So we, we saw, we had a vision of what the throne room looked like. Uh, if you remember, John explained that to us. There was uh, obviously the Father sitting up in uh, his, his altar, his, his throne. Uh, Ms. Davian asked me a great question last Wednesday at the end of, of service. And uh, we were talking about this. And Julie and I have always had this conversation. That when we get to heaven, who are we going to see? Now, not who is in our relatives, but who, as far as the Trinity is concerned, are we going to see? And so when, when you think about that, and I've always thought about that, and I thought, well, you know, the Bible says God is spirit, and Jesus was the human manifestation of the spirit of God. Uh, the three are one, but they're three distinct. And then the Holy Spirit was obviously a spirit. It was the spirit, was the gift that was given to us. And so, you know, my view has kind of been that you're going to see Jesus because Jesus is the, the, the human. He went back as the human manifestation of God. But when you read Revelation and study Revelation, uh, you see that in John 4, John sees in the throne room, he sees the throne of God. And he sees, and he says, what does he say that he sees? Someone sitting on the throne. So he saw God. He saw the Father. But he, then he also saw the Spirit, because he said the seven spirits were there, which is the, the unified, the Holy Spirit. He saw the Spirit. But then he also saw the Lamb. He saw Jesus. And so I'm convinced, uh, the Scripture teaches, that we're going to see all three. And so I think it's those kinds of revelations that the Lord continues to give us. Uh, I, I think it's awesome that, that we have this picture in Revelation of the Lamb in chapter 5 going up to the throne and taking the scroll from the Father. So you obviously had that kind of relationship. And, 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 so, and, and what's, to me, what's great about that is John's seeing all of this. John is, John is envisioning all of this. It's not that, uh, I mean, he's there and he's seeing all of this happen. So I think that's just great teaching for us to help us have a little more practical understanding of the Trinity. All right, so now we're moving into six. And so why do we call it the beginning? <clears throat> because the, the lamb, if you remember back where we were, there, there was no one found worthy to take the scroll. And so John's crying. One of the 24 elders says, you know, wait, the lamb that was slain, he's worthy to take the scroll and open the scroll. And so, the, so Jesus goes to the Father. He takes the scroll. And now he's going to begin opening the scroll and unveiling what's going to happen during the tribulation time. So this really is the beginning of the tribulation. All right? So that's the, the, the time that we're moving into. Now, here's a question that you could have. If we're not going to be here for any of this, why should it matter to us? If we're going to be raptured out, if the church is raptured out at the end of three, right before four starts, so you've got the vision, you've got the presentation of the lamb and the scroll in five, and now in chapter six, we're going to start going into the scroll. Why should it matter to us? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. We'll, we'll get to those in just a minute, but I think one big reason is we should know what is happening so we can help people avoid being in that process. There is an end time that's coming. There is a tribulation that's coming. This is not uh, the world and our connection to the world is not our friend. I was talking to somebody this week, and they were saying to me, and you've heard people say this before, probably over the last couple of weeks, I just want something that's normal. I just want something to go back to normal. <clears throat> so so, so, so why, do we, why do we yearn for that so much? What is it about that that we need? So my question to this person was this. Could it be that we found too much security in the world? We're, we're dying for something to go back to normal so we can be settled well is that an indicator to us that maybe we found too much connection too much friendship we have too much too much trust in the world and what the world is doing 
You know, John says in his letter in 1 John, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. So, so I, I, I think, hopefully, prayerfully, all of us has, have, have done some introspection as we've gone through all of this. You know, we, we desperately, I, I would love and I would hope this is the case. And I would ask you this question. This, this would be a great survey question for all of us. Why do we want church to go back? And what do we want to go back to? So another way to ask that question is this. What have you missed? Wednesday night dinner. Well, there's, there you go. That's a great Baptist answer. A good meal, right? Nothing wrong with that because there's a lot of fellowship that happens in the context of that. But, you know, we, we, we miss community. We miss our biblical community. Hopefully we miss uh, being in small group Bibles teaching. That's why we want to go back to Sunday school. You know, those types of things. Right? We, we want to miss the things that are, what does our heart yearn for when everything is taken away? That's a great question. And so hopefully we have a, a clear vision of what God has for us, and we yearn for that. We yearn for that. You know, is it hard for us at 50, 60, 70, uh, even at 20, 30, 40, is it hard for us to yearn for heaven? I mean, is it really hard for us to yearn for that when we think it's so good here? This person asked me, he said, how, how, could, you, you know, how could you want to go to heaven now, how, how could you want Jesus to come back now when you're about to have a granddaughter? It's a great question. When you've got young, young grandchildren. And so my response was, why will it be different? I would much rather have them there than here. I would much rather have my family with Jesus to, tomorrow than here. Because we won't have to deal with all the stuff that's in this world. Because I have a view of heaven that the lord is going to have us all together so so again hopefully we can catch that and yearn for that all right we're going to move into what's called the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse you've you've heard that language you you know that's kind of where we are in the seals you've pro again you've probably heard the language the reference to the four horsemen but it does refer to the fo the first four seals that will be opened in this scroll so the picture i want you to have in your mind is this is that there's this scroll that has seven seals on it and as each seal is opened a little bit more of the scroll is revealed. So as, as Jesus begins opening these, uh, these seals, you're going to see these things emerging. Now, what, a couple of things we have to think about when we begin studying this part of Revelation moving forward. Here's the first thing. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there are four symbols under which these judgments evolve. So from here moving forward... This is all going to be about God pouring out his judgment and his wrath on an unbelieving world. So God is going to pour out and he's going to begin pouring out his wrath through seven years of tribulation. Uh, you're going to see the opening of the seven sealed book. We're going to talk about that tonight and probably next Wednesday. Then we're going to see the sounding of seven trumpets. Then there's going to be the seven thunders. And then there's going to be the outpouring of the seven bowls of God's wrath. And here's what you're going to see as we, as we walk through Revelation in this is that it's going to get considerably worse each time. And so when it gets down to the seven bowls, that's really where God is pouring out. When we hear about and we talk about the wrath of God, this is where he's really pouring out his wrath. This is going to happen. This is going to come in that last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so this is what we're going to see as we begin studying and as we start going through these chapters. Here's something else we have to remember as we walk into Revelation. The events of Revelation aren't linear. So, so we're not going to see in linear fashion, okay, we're going to have the seven seals, and when that's over, then we're going to have the seven uh, trumpets, then we're going to have the seven. It doesn't work that way. Revelation doesn't work in a linear fashion. So some of this overlaps. For example, as we talk about the four horsemen, the first four seals, the first four seals are going to give us a view, basically, of what's going to happen throughout the seven years of tribulation. So when we dive into the first four seals, they're different from uh, five, six, and seven, because it's going it's to describe basically these first four horsemen. So the events are going to worsen over time, and the first four seals represent the conditions throughout the tribulation period. So as we talk about the first four, the first four are basically, here's what Jesus is doing for, for John in the first four seals. He's giving him a 30,000 foot view of what is going to happen in the tribulation period, for the, so those seven years before the second coming. And if you want to parallel this, you can parallel this with, with Matthew 24. 
because Jesus did the same thing for the disciples in Matthew 24. He didn't talk about it from a seal perspective, but he did talk about it from an event perspective. So the things that you'll see in the first four seals are the same things that Jesus explained to his disciples in Matthew 24. <clears throat> so let's talk about the first seal and see who this is, because basically what I want us to do is read the scripture, identify what the seal is, who the writer is, and then what it means for us. <clears throat> Here's the first one. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. The horseman on it had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a victor to conquer. So the first thing we do, this is the first horse. This is the first seal. First seal, Jesus takes the scroll. He, he, he breaks that first seal, and a little is revealed, and this is what is revealed out of that scroll. So here's what we need to do is we talk about the rider on the white horse. He's always the first one. We need to figure out who the, who the rider is, and we need to figure out what the purpose of the rider on the white horse is. So just based on the description that I've shared with you, when you read uh, this white horse, horseman on it had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he went out as a victor to conquer. Now, if I were to ask you, who do you think, just off the top of your head, based on that description, is the rider on the white horse? Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And that's the purpose of the rider on the white horse. Because it's not Christ, it's the Antichrist. It's the Antichrist. So the rider on the white horse is not Christ, it's the Antichrist. So the first thing that's going to be revealed, the first horse that will be revealed, will be this Antichrist. So let's talk about um, the, the identity of this horse. Now notice, uh, when, it, when it describes the rider on the white horse, the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. Now the word anti means against, but it also means instead of. So in Greek language, when you see that word Antichrist, it, it doesn't just mean against. Now the Antichrist is going to be against Christ, but the Antichrist is going to be instead of, it's going to be the substitute. The Antichrist is going to be the one that steps into the place and basically begins to tell everybody that he is going to be the Savior of the world. Now, we're not going to get into trying to figure out who that is and who it's been. And, and you know, we have questions like, well, is the Antichrist alive today? Uh, those types of questions. You know, Billy Graham wrote a book, gosh, several years ago called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And when Billy Graham wrote that book, I think it was in the late 70s or early 80s, he said in the book that he believed the Antichrist was alive when he wrote that book. Now, it's interesting for us to, as we talk about the Antichrist, uh, but this, this rider on the white horse, the one that's going to be revealed first, is going to be, be the one that comes in and basically puts himself in the position of being the Christ. Now, we know that this person is going to be a political leader. This person is going to come from the east. And if we remember, the war that, that we talk about, it really doesn't involve us. It involves the area over there in Iran and Israel. They're going after Israel. All that happens in the tribulation, they're going after Israel. Israel, And so that's why it's so important for us to watch Israel. And I know Carl Jones does, Jones does a great job of talking about that. And he's, he's a student of Israel and, and really has some great things to say about that. But let's look, let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 13. And let's learn a little bit about what Paul uh, taught the Thessalonians about this man coming called the Antichrist. So listen to what the scripture says. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be easily upset in mind or, or troubled, either by spirit or by a message or by a letter, as if from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. See, the problem with the problem with Thessalonian church is that somebody had told them that Jesus had already come. The day of the Lord had already happened. And so Paul's writing back to them saying, listen, don't be upset. It hadn't happened yet. Here's why it hadn't happened yet. Okay? Verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For the day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now, who's that referring to? That's talking about the Antichrist, talking about the rider on the first horse, the rider on the white horse, right? So, so when it talks about the day of the Lord here, it's not talking about the rapture. It's talking about the second coming. The day of the Lord phrase always references the day when Jesus comes down, steps foot on this earth, and he fights the battle of Armageddon, and he sets up his millennial reign. So that the day of the Lord always references that part of the eschatological calendar, all right? 
Um, so let's listen to what he says about this Antichrist. He first comes, he's the man of lawlessness, he's the son of destruction, he'll have several names. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's sanctuary publicizing that he himself is God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you about this. And you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. Now, that's important for us as a church. You know what currently restrains the Antichrist. What, what does it mean for the Antichrist to be restrained? So I want you to think about that. We have that picture that you have this rider on this horse, and he is waiting to come out of the gate. I love to watch three horse races. The Kentucky Derby. What's the second one? The Preakness and the Belmont. Man, I don't watch any other race horse, but, but I love to watch those three, especially the Kentucky Derby because that's where I'm from. And, man, they put those horses in those gates, and they're jumping up. They can't wait to get Like, that's the way I vision this Antichrist on that white horse, just waiting. But he's being restrained. You know what's restraining him? The Holy Spirit. So as long as the Holy Spirit's here, and who is the Holy Spirit in and working through? All of us. So as long as we're still here, as long as he has us here, and the Holy Spirit is here, the Antichrist is restrained. But he's saying, you know what's holding him back? It's the church. It's the Holy Spirit. But as soon as we're taken out, guess what happens? That first seal is opened, and here he comes on that white horse, okay? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the, the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way, and then the lost one will be revealed. Speaking of this in Revelation, the Lord will, will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. They perished because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. For this reason, God send, sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false, so that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but enjoyed unrighteousness. So Paul gives us a view of what's coming, this, this Antichrist. He will be the son of lawlessness, the son of perdition. There's a lot of names that it carries. Now, uh, let's, let's look what, uh, well, let's talk about the purpose of, the, of this rider. Here's the purpose of the rider on the white horse. If we know who he is, he's the Antichrist, what does that scripture tell us is his purpose? And the scripture gives us a pretty clear indication about his purpose. All right, here's the first one. To make war on earth with limited power. Now, why do we say that? I want you to notice this. I looked and there was a white horse. The horseman on it had a bow. Does anyone see a problem? He has a bow but he has no arrows, but he has no arrows. And so that's indicating to us that he comes and he will come to make war, but he's going to have limited power. His power will be, will be limited. He won't be the conqueror. He'll think he's the conqueror, but he won't be the conqueror because he's going to have limited power based on the scripture. He's given a bow. Now, here's the second thing that we see. A crown was given to him. Um, now, this, now, the point we want to make on that is this. He will rule, but he'll have limited authority. Now, again, we, we hear this picture and we think, well, this has to be Jesus. But here's how we know if we dig into the, to the Greek language here. He has a bow, but he has limited power because he has no arrows. He has a crown on his head. He was given a crown. Now, the Greek word for that crown is stephanos. It's not diadem. So when you hear about Jesus coming, he comes with many diadems. Those, those are crowns of royalty. The Stephanos that he was given was the same crown that's talked about that's given to like a winner in the Olympic Games. So in the Greek, in the Greek time when they had their Olympic Games, the, the winners of those contests were given a Stephanos. Now here's what was interesting about that. It was always a temporary crown. It was a crown made of, uh, of, of, of foliage and they would wrap it around in a circle, fold it up. You've, you've seen it on TV. They would put it on their head. That would basically be their award. They didn't have the gold medals like we do now. So they were given those crowns. Now, here was interesting about those crowns. Those crowns were always temporary because what would happen to that foliage? It would be green for a while, but it would die. So it wasn't a diadem. It wasn't a permanent crown. It wasn't a royal crown. It was a temporary crown. So the Antichrist is going to be given temporary power, but he's going to have limited power. Then he's going to conquer, but he's going to have limited success. Let's go back and look what that scripture said. 
and he went out as a victor to conquer. And he's going to conquer, but he's going to conquer in the context of what Jesus allows him to do. Now I want you to hear a little bit about what John says about the Antichrist. Because I think this is interesting when you read different, different um, apostles talking about the same topic. Here's what John says. Children, this is 1 John 2, 18 and 19. It is the last hour, and you may have heard Antichrist is coming. So again, that was a huge topic of discussion uh, in the first century. Even now, here's what's interesting. Many, look at this, many Antichrist have come. So what is John referencing when he says, you've heard the Antichrist is coming. Now notice, notice the capitalization on that word. The Antichrist, the one, the rider on the white horse, you've heard he's coming. But there have been many Antichrist who've already come. Now remember the definition of Antichrist against Christ. So there have been many who have come that were against Christ or tried to stand in the place instead of Christ. Listen to how John describes that. We know from this that it is the last hour. Now watch what he says. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. So how, so, so how is that tied into the context of Antichrist? He's telling them, yes, the Antichrist is coming. And that's an individual person that God has established. He, he's, he's been marked. We, they know who he is. He is coming. But there are, there are other people who stand against Christ. And as a matter of fact, there were people who stood against Christ, but they were actually in the fold for a while. Now, I want you to think about a story that John could be referencing. Can you remember a story, a miracle, give you a little more clue, where there happened to be something like this that John could be pointing back to? So let's go to John. So you don't have to turn there, but John chapter 5 and 6. Gets, gets into the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, if you remember, John talks about it and he says that there were many disciples who followed Jesus after that. Many disciples who followed Jesus because they loved the fact that they were on the free meal program. I mean, man, we showed up, we hear a little message, we get a, we get a meal. This is awesome. It's kind of like Wednesday night. And so they're continuing to follow Jesus. And then Jesus preaches a message on the bread of life. And you remember what he said in that message? He laid it on the line. He was shucking the corn. That's how we, talk, we, we say in the South. He said, if you don't drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you can have no part of me. And he was talking about basically that Jesus has to be in us. We have to, he wasn't talking about literally us eating his flesh, drinking his blood, but literally he has to be, he has to be in us. It's, it, he was giving them a concept of, it's not about what I can do for you. I want to be in you. I want to be who you are. I want to be all. And John says from that point, many of his disciples turned and followed him no more. And you remember what Jesus did right then? He looked at his 12, and what did he say? Boys, y'all want to go too? Y'all want to go? Right there's the door. You ever had that talk before? Right there's the door. Right, Teddy? Don't let it hit you on the way out. And Peter looked at him and said what? Where are we going to go? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. So John is thinking back to that moment where there were thousands of people who were following Christ, thousands of disciples. But what did John say about those people? So, to me, it's very interesting. They went out from us because they were really never of us. Because if they would have been of us, they would have stayed with us. But watch this. But they went out so that it might be made clear 
that none of them belong to us. So let me ask you a question. We've been out of church. We're having three services. But as far as we remember church, right, we were out, well, we were out for 15 weeks. 15 weeks. And not just us, but a lot of churches, you know, across the country. Do, do you think there's a chance that something like this could possibly happen to our churches? They, they went out from us. They never really came back because they were never really of us. Because if they were of us, Now, I'm not making a judgment on the fact that, you know, listen, we're, we're, we're not in the state at this point. Well, we're, we're not given the right to judge that anyway. So that, that's not our call. <clears throat> but I do think that, that there has been and there will be these types of calling periods where Jesus is purifying his bride. So Jesus will purify his bride through this whole process. There's no doubt about that. Because there are many as he says, Antichrist who come. Because remember, Jesus said, you're either for me or what? You're against me. There's really no middle ground. There's, there's no neutral ground when it comes to Jesus. We either for him or against him. All right, so here's, here's the question, because a lot of people would think and would say, well, that does sound like Christ. So let's do this. Let's go back and let's look at Jesus and when he comes. Now I want you to see the difference between Jesus when he comes on his white horse and the Antichrist when he comes on his white horse. So here's Revelation 19. Here's when Jesus comes on his white horse. I want you to notice the difference between his coming and the coming of the Antichrist, which is the first seal. Then I saw heaven open up. This is Revelation 19:11, And there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. Same colored horse, different person on it. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. Many diadems were on his head. Not Stephanos, not temporary crowns, but permanent crowns. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. Who are those people? If you don't like to ride a horse, you better get ready. <laughs> the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses. You know who that is? That's us. That's us. And notice how we're dressed. Pure white linen. You know what that represents? We're riding in the righteousness of Christ. Because we don't have a righteousness of our own. But we're clothed in his righteousness. He goes on to say this. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And his name was written on his robe and on his thigh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's a whole lot different than that Antichrist who's coming on that white horse, who's coming with limited power, limited authority, and a limited purpose, but not Jesus when he comes. So here's a question. Just, let's, let's just stop and think about the first seal. How is that practical to us? We're not going to be here the Antichrist is coming. What, what does it matter to us? Here's two things I want you to think about as we think about the practicality of this kind of study. Here it is. Number one, don't spend your time looking for the Antichrist. Look for Jesus Christ. You see, here's where people get messed up when it comes to eschatology. Is we get so wrapped up in eschatology, we start looking for the wrong thing. So in, Thess in Thessalonica, they were so concerned that they had missed everything because they were looking for the wrong thing. But Paul says, listen, don't... We don't need to spend our time looking for trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. 
I mean, if, if you've studied eschatology, we've done that. We've thought through and said, well, it could be this, it could be this. No, we just need to be waiting for Jesus Christ and be ready for him. But here's the second thing that motivates me more than anything. Man, why do we want anybody to go through that? Tell somebody about Jesus. I mean, let this be a motivation for us to tell somebody in a way that they could avoid all of this. All right, that's the first seal. The first seal is the Antichrist. Uh, we've got a few minutes. Let's go over the second seal. I know I promised you guys we'd do a chapter at night, but this, th this is a little different, so you've got to give me a little slack on this one, okay? The seals are a little different. I think we, we can move into them a little faster once we go. Here's the second seal. Revelation 6, 3, and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its horseman was empowered to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. So let's talk about this second rider. The second seal is the rider on the red horse. Here's a couple things we need to remember about him. The rider's given the ability to take peace from the earth. Here's what's interesting to me, is that this is the rider who's going to create war, but I want you to notice how he creates war. It doesn't say that he goes to create war. This is really interesting to me because this talks about and references who we really are. Watch what he does. He doesn't go down and create war. What does he do? Isn't that interesting? He's going to take peace away. He's not going to create war. He's going to take peace away. Now, we don't know how that's going to happen or even what that means. We don't need to worry about that. But here's, what, here's the result of taking peace from the earth. Watch what happens. You take peace from the earth, and people will begin slaughtering one another and destroying one another. So there is something, there is an agent, there's something that God has on our planet that allows for us, for the most part, to be in peace. How can we be right now in peace? How can people live in peace? We've had two world wars. And, and maybe the third one is going to be this one. We don't know that. But there's been, there have been two. And there have been other skirmishes. But for people to not be a follower of God, how can we have peace? Because there's something that God does that puts peace on the earth. That's why it says in Romans 13 and 2 Peter and 1 Peter 2, he puts government and authorities to give us this kind of peace, some kind of control on our planet. That's why it's so crazy for people to talk about removing policemen and those types of organizations. You remove, you remove that kind of control that God's put on this earth, and guess what happens? We start slaughtering one another. Let me tell you why that is. Because we are, because we are evil, depraved people without Jesus. You see, we have a tendency to believe that, that most people are generally good people. Like, I mean, wouldn't you agree that, that most people believe that? I mean, even, even it's hard for us to think, man, are people really that evil? I, I don't know if you've read or looked into, uh, and Tim and I were having this discussion, you know, read or looked into what's going on with all this Epstein stuff and this island and what, you know, the stuff that they say goes on on that island. Let me tell you something. It's hard for me to look at that and go, how in the world could people be involved in something like that? And, and maybe not just that illustration, but just pedophilia, child pornography, just those types of things. Like, how in the world could people be there? And here's the problem with most of us. And thankfully, this is true. We've never seen the depth of depravity that really exists in our world. And thank God that we haven't. But there are some people that protect us and serve us that do see that. Here's what happens when this rider comes. This rider comes and he removes peace. That's, what, that's the right he's been given. He's been given the ability to take peace from the earth. And when that is removed, guess what happens? Everybody turns on each other. And they just start creating war. And they just start slaughtering each other. What keeps the world from destroying each other is the presence of peace. When peace is removed, depravity will rule. And so we've got to think about that and understand that, that right now, two things are in place right now that are keeping our world in somewhat of an order. Number one is the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
The presence of the Holy Spirit is what's keeping the lawless one that's keeping all this from starting. All of this is ready to go. They're, they're in the gate and they're ready to unleash. And so what's restraining that is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our world, which is the, the Spirit of God in his churches. And when he removes that, then it all begins, the rider comes, and the seven years of tribulation will start. But then when the second rider comes, there's something called peace. So there's this order of peace that God has put and he's established in our world. It's keeping everybody from just acting like they are in chaos. If you've heard what's going on up in Seattle, where they've taken over a number of city blocks, isn't it interesting that what they're doing in that is very, very, very unpeaceful. You know why? Because that's what happens when you remove that element of peace. People go after each other. They slaughter each other. That's who we are. So I want to go back to what I said earlier. We're just going to end with two. Let's study, let's study this and let's understand it. But let's not get so wrapped up in the in the pictures and the illustrations, what it could and couldn't be. Let's understand how blessed we are to be in this part of Christian history. Do, you, do we understand how blessed we are that Lord, the Lord allowed us to be a part of the Christian history, that we have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and escape all of this? What a blessing that is. But here's the second blessing. If we really believe this is going to happen, if we really believe that there will be a day that Jesus Christ will come and the archangel will shout, the groom is coming to get his bride, and the trumpet will blast, and we're all going to be taken up. If we really believe that, then how many people do we have right now that we don't want to be left behind? I, I, I loved that I got a text from a mother this week that was concerned about her kid's salvation. And so she said, I'm just going to sit them down and I want to share the gospel with them. Here's what's awesome. I get to baptize one of them Sunday morning. That's the kind of, of intensity we should live with, church. We should really believe that he could come back tonight. And if he does, who's going to get left? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the truth of your word, its power in our life, and, and God, how it motivates us to be the kind of people you want us to be. Lord, as we start walking through this, and we've just opened up two seals, Lord, we know we've got others to come. Lord, let it just, let it just fuel our fire to tell people who you are, uh, to, to be motivated for evangelism, not, Father, so that we can count and, and, and send in, uh, not because of that, Lord, but because we truly believe, Jesus, that you could come back tonight. And if you do, Lord, we don't want people to be left behind. God, let our passion for evangelism come from our passion and love for you. And God, I, I thank you that you have sealed us for your day of redemption. But Lord, let us not hang on to that. Let us be ones who are willing to share that to the lost and dying world. I pray for that for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming tonight. Look forward to seeing you Sunday morning.